So we're very pleased to have today with us Professor Crystal Haxlin from Rochester University. Professor Haxlin is the James V. Aquavella Professor and Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Ophthalmology and Flaum Eye Institute. She also serves as the Associate Director of the Center for Visual Science and Co-Director of its training program. She holds secondary appointments in the Institute of Optics, the Department of Neuroscience and Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Rochester. She did her BSc in Medicine at the University of Sydney and then continued to do a PhD there in the same field as, under the supervision of Anne Sefton and um, Bogdan De Dreher. She then continued to do a postdoc with Bill Merrigan and Tanya Pasternak at the University of Rochester before joining the faculty of the, of the Department of Ophthalmology. Her research focuses on understanding how and what extent visual functions can be restored after damage to the adult visual system. She's the holder of eight patents and multiple grants from the NIH, NYC, New York State and industry. Professor Haxlin authored more than 80 papers and book chapters she has received multiple prestigious awards and honors for her research and academic achievements. She was the inaugural president of the Rochester chapter of the, of the Society for Neuroscience. She has been invited to give dozens of seminars and lectures from across the world. Locally and nationally, Dr. Haxton serves on multiple steering and executive committees and she acts as the ombudsperson for University of Rochester graduate students and postdocs. She divides her attention between developing perceptual training strategies to induce vision restoration in stroke patients and manipulating molecular substrates of corneal wound healing to prevent and treat scarring, induce nerve regeneration, and restore optical quality fo following insults to the ocular surface. She's also part of the team that developed the LRI, LR, LIRIC, a new non-surgical alternative to laser refractive surgery. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Crystal, to our bar University Vision Science Seminar to hear about your exciting research and many thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sharon, for this lovely introduction. And um, I will start by sharing my screen here and getting this presentation started. Can everybody see that okay? All right, awesome. I am gonna minimize the view. I would encourage, I would say everybody to ask questions if you need clarifications um, during the talk. Um, but if you have deep philosophical questions, let's keep those until perhaps um, the very end, if that's okay. All right. Um, okay, so, Sharon um, gave a very broad introduction and, and I do do um, my research, I would say, is, is relatively um, wide ranging. Um, but uh, what I would like to talk to, to talk to you about today, and it's particular with this, for this audience, is the work that we've done on retraining vision in people who have damage to primary visual cortex to V1. So without further ado, um, I would like to start by mentioning that this, this, it really takes a village. This work was not done just by me. I had a lot of collaborators over the years and I will try and, um, and highlight them as I go through the presentation. Um, multiple graduate students, including some of the more um, recent ones that I'm listing here, postdocs, some outstanding technical staff. And of course, I couldn't do this without the funding that we've received uh, from the National Eye Institute and the NIH and the Research to Prevent Blindness Foundation. And of course, our study participants are just as much as our, our collaborators as um, my scientific collaborators are in this work. Um, and their insights and um, commentary um, are often extremely revealing and have pushed us in new directions as we've gone along in this work. I do have a conflict of interest to declare as I'm co-inventor on this particular patent that involves the retraining approach that we've developed uh, for this patient population, as well as some virtual reality um, approaches also. So what problem am I really talking about here? I'm going to minimize the screen here. So I'm not gonna be able to see anybody. So if you have questions, please just unmute yourself and just speak out your question because I will not be able to see you. Okay, 
Occipital strokes cause blindness. So um, this is a schematic diagram um, through the visual system of humans, um, starting with the eyes at the very front um, and the pathways that take that information towards the central nervous system. You, I'm sure, are all very familiar with this uh, with the schematic and, um, and these connections, but they are, I'm um, putting them up here just to mostly highlight the fact that it is specifically damage to these areas in red that will cause a loss of conscious vision that is often referred to as homonymous hemianopia. It's homonymous because it affects the same area of the visual field through both eyes. Um, it's also called cerebral visual impairment, or we've often referred to it in our work as cortically induced blindness. And it presents as, as I mentioned, a loss of conscious vision measured with light detection perimetry over the same region of the visual field through both eyes. Sometimes there is foveal impairment in the sense that part of the foveal representation is lost. Sometimes and oftentimes it is actually spared. So it is really damaged to the LGN, the optic radiations and primary visual cortex that gives you this kind of deficit. Damage to extra stride visual areas does not usually give you a visual field cut measured in this way. It gives you other visual defects, but not specifically this visual field cut. So what of the natural history? And I, I mention up here that it is, I'm referring here to the clinical natural history, what we know from clinical studies, because that's mostly what we know. Um, clinically, when the, when the lesion happens, the stroke happens, um, it tends to induce an instantaneous vision loss as far as can be determined. And then within the next few months, and we're talking about the next three months or so, there can be spontaneous visual field improvements. Now these are measured, always measured with light detection perimetry in most, in most cases. In some cases, they were also measured with confrontation. We're talking about, you know, the doctor sits across the patient, asks them to stare at their nose and moves their fingers into the field of view and sees where the patient detects this. So this is confrontation, which is often commonly used to assess whether the, a person has a visual field defect or not. So within the first few months after the stroke, when the brain still looks something like this and there's still some um, integrity of the gray matter and the white matter in there, um, there can be some spontaneous improvements. And these are thought to be due mostly to resolving inflammation um, at the lesion site. But once the patients hit six months after stroke, which they considered then to enter the chronic post-stroke period, and the brain looks more like this, i.e., there's been shrinkage of the gray matter, of the white matter as well, and the space vacated by brain is now occupied by fluid, right? With once patients enter this period, there are no further spontaneous improvements that tend to be uh, reported, at least when measured with the clinical perimetry tests that are common. Um, that, that are commonly used to assess this. In fact, um, some of the more recent work that we have done has suggested that not only do you not get any more spontaneous improvements in light detection perimetry um, after six months post-stroke, you might actually start to have a progressive worsening um, in measures of light detection perimetry over time. And the dogma for this patient population is that the blindness cannot be recovered and that is still the majority of the advice that patients are given clinically is still that they should literally go home and get used to being blind. If they are fortunate, they might be um, sent and um, have prescriptions for some forms of therapies, either substitution, and Eli Pelli has been a pioneer in this, in the area of using prisms and glasses to actually allow these patients to function better with the residual vision that they have. Um, or they can be taught to develop compensatory eye movements, so to increase the scanning behavior, especially into the blind field, in order to capture the information they need to do um, to go about their everyday life. And 
And these two approaches, again, they're not widely available. I wish they were more widely available, but they are really designed to help people learn to function with their residual vision. They are not purposefully designed to restore any of the vision lost itself. Now that is the, um, that's the domain of vision restoration therapies. And these unfortunately are very, have been very controversial over the years clinically. Um, there was one clinical product, Nova Vision BRT, which is still offered I think in some places. Um, but which essentially ended up um, having some um, unclear results. Let's, let's just put it that way um, as to their efficacy. So most of the vision restoration therapies that are currently in investigation are really experimental. And most of them have been tested in chronic patients. And th there's a good reason for that because chronic patients are outside the, um, the time frame in which they can have spontaneous visual improvements. And therefore it is easy in chronic patients to distinguish whether they, their improvements are due to, to the therapy that is being um, attempted or to, to a spontaneous phenomenon since those don't seem to exist in chronics. So these experimental therapies of only or approaches for vision restoration have only recently been attempted in patients who are not chronic, who are in this first phase when there can be some spontaneous improvements that occur. And what have they uh, consisted of? So uh, I, have, um, I have summarized these visually, uh, all of the different approaches um, that have been tried for experimental vision restoration. Um, and they can be classified in two major categories, detection training. So where you're detecting a particular target presented as this, this first schematic diagram is for, um, represents the Nova Vision approach, whoops, in which um, patients were asked to fixate this yellow target over here. And they were then uh, asked to detect um, a spot, a white spot of light that appeared on a black screen. And this appeared at a variety of different locations that straddled the border between the blind field and the intact field. So this was a simple detection task, but it was variable in location. Um, there was a motion stimulus here. Um, there was also detection of a spot of light um, that was tried by Sylvie Chocron's group over here. Um, Arash Sarai um, did a detection of a flickering grating uh, within the blind field or within different regions of the blind field. Vandenberg tried different spots of light. So these are just examples of detection training tasks that were given to this patient population with a, a variety of different um, levels of success. And then there was also, there's also a whole class of experimental restoration approaches, which include discrimination training. So here, the, the participant is asked to discriminate or to identify um, a particular target, visual target that's presented usually in the blind field. For instance, identify the letter, and these are letters of different sizes and different luminances relative to the background or identify or um, discriminate the orientation of a Gabor patch, um, horizontal or vertical, the direction of motion of uh, global random dot, globally moving random dot stimuli. Um, I will identify that these, um, these particular paradigms in red are ones that our lab has, had, has developed and published on. Um, this one over here is from Lucia Vina's um, group, and again, Sylvie Chocron on the right-hand side. So there's been a whole variety of approaches that have been tried. Um, I'm going to focus on what we have done, and in particular, our visual training philosophy. So one of the things that we started doing from the very beginning was to try and recruit as clean a patient population as we possibly could. So we had very strict inclusion criteria. All of our patients had strokes, not TBI, not surgical resections. They all had strokes and all of the strokes had to affect V1 as verified by MRI, not the lateral geniculate nucleus. So we did not, we excluded anybody with LGN damage. We excluded anybody with neglect, ocular disease, um, bad fixation, um, and, and people had to be computer literate and really cognitively intact. We then, as a route, as a routine, we performed baseline vision testing with eye tracker enforced fixation. So all of the testing that we did in our lab 
whether it was psychophysics or visual perimetry tests, including the clinical perimetry tests, um, everything was done with controlled fixation with an eye tracker enforced control fixation paradigm. Um, and we also performed a whole range of other tests, MRI, including fMRI, EEG, OCT, et cetera. So then after these baseline tests were done, we sent the patient home to train and they trained at home with lab issue software. And we sent them home with a chin rest so we could position them precisely from um, their computer monitor. Um, while they were training at home, we had weekly remote quality control of their training. Um, and this is now all done with a cloud server based system. Um, and then after a period of time, depending on the experiment in question, we brought the patient home and verified everything. Verified, first of all, their at-home training performance um, and made sure that it could be replicated in the lab with eye tracker and force fixation control. And then we repeated all of our baseline tests again uh, with the eye tracker. So, so far over the last 20 years or so, we've worked with, um, I would say about, 100 patients. So this, these are just pictures of our in-lab system and also our um, at-home system resembled this system. So the big difference is that in lab, we have the eye tracker at home. We really can't, um, we really cannot eye track their eyes yet. Um, the technology is way too expensive given the number of patients that we have to work with at this point. Plus it's also difficult to self-calibrate for a patient. I mean, some of them are very good, but they're not that good. Okay, so, so what is the general approach? So we start, and there's a reason that we do clinical perimetry tests in every single person. For one, it is a test that they have seen before that they can then bring the results of to their own doctors after they are done with our training study. But it also gives us an idea of where their visual field deficit is, how severe it is, and how uh, reliable um, the, the measurements can be in this particular patient. The first thing we do is we train the patients to do discrimination tasks, and we do that centrally. And once they, um, they get the task and they, um, they they then um, are able to learn to do the task with the eye tracker at a peripheral location. So we move this directly up. Then we start actually mapping the borders of their blind field. We try and start with a stimulus straddling um, the intact and the blind hemifield. And then we move it, we measure performance there. And then we move the stimulus deeper into the blind field by a few degrees. And we measure performance again. And then we do that again and again until we find a failure point. And then we may even go a little bit further than that failure point, just to map deeper in the blind field. And that gives us an idea of where that border uh, between some partial perception and complete failure of perception occurs. And this is probably the most common task that we use to do the mapping and to also measure performance in this patient population. It is a left versus right global direction discrimination task. The trial sequence is simple. The patient starts with a fixation spot that they have to fixate reliably um, for about a thousand milliseconds. And then a stimulus consisting of dots that drift either to the left or the right appears somewhere in their blind field at a predetermined location. They are not allowed to um, move their eyes towards the stimulus and that's enforced. The stimulus only lasts for 500 milliseconds and then the patient has to tell us whether the direction was to the left or the right. And so this is the basic, the basic paradigm, but we also do things like increase the range of dot directions so that we can estimate how well the, the visual system of these patients is able to integrate across these, um, these um, directions. And we extract from each training session a direction integration threshold. So what is the largest range of dot directions that can be presented to this patient in this blind field location and they can actually extract, correctly extract whether the global motion is to the left or the right. So, um, so we can measure both percent correct and a direction integration threshold on this particular task. So the training that we do with this, pa this, this patient population is consists of them having to do at least 300 trials per location 
per day, and they usually train in multiple, at one or two different locations in their blind field. They have to train at least five days per week. And, and we keep them training until they reach stable and close to normal performance. And that's not only in terms of percent correct performance, but also their thresholds, whatever the thresholds might be. If we're training them on this global direction discrimination task, it would be direction range thresholds. If we train them on a contrast task, it would be contrast thresholds. Um, and then of course we bring them back into the lab and we verify this, um, their performance in the lab with the eye tracker, just to make sure that if they if we see performance improvements over time um, at these blind field locations, that they're not due to the patient actually le having learned to cheat and look towards the stimulus. So this is an example in three patients and we've published this um, extensively. So uh, this is an example from three patients at three blind field locations. These are graphs of percent correct performance on this global direction discrimination task. And we can see, and with the red dots are in lab with eye tracker, the black dots are at home performance. And you can see this person trained in lab only. Um, and what we're plotting is percent correct performance as a function of number of training sessions. So you can equate this to the number of days of training. And some you know, take a short amount of time, some people take a much longer amount of time to improve and get to 80% correct or thereabouts. Um, some people show a very abrupt improvement and some people a much more gradual improvement over time. And this um, set of three graphs on the right-hand side plots the normalized direction range thresholds. This is direction integration threshold. So everybody starts, sorry, everybody starts at 100% uh, threshold, which means they cannot do the task at all. And at some point in time when their percent correct performance improves enough consistently, then their thresholds actually come down. And they usually reach the intact levels of performance that are measured in the person's intact hemifield. So that's another, um, that's another advantage of working with this patient population is that most of them have unilateral lesions. That means they have an intact hemifield of vision, which um, is fed by an intact V1 and, and extra stripes circuitry. Um, with which we can compare every aspect of performance that we're interested in recovering in their blind field. So not only can we recover direction discrimination, global direction discrimination in this patient population, we can also recover um, other things that um, surprised us to some extent. Things like the orientation of static non-flickering Gabor patches presented in their blind field. These are examples from two people. Now, the reason that this was surprising is because this kind of stimulus does not elicit blind sight normally. And so we weren't sure that we would ever be able to recover the performance or the discrimination of a static non-flickering stimulus such as this. And yet these people do, um, do show training-induced improvements quite reliably for this task. Okay, so the general properties of this training-induced perceptual learning in chronic blind fields. And this, so, so all of this work was done in chronic um, stroke patients. So more than six months after stroke, sometimes years after stroke. In all cases, the training is extremely slow. The tra training-induced recovery and relearning of vision is extremely slow. It takes weeks to months of daily training to recover one task at one location. In contrast to, um, to a lot of the perceptual training literature in visually intact people, however, the improvements here are very large. They go from chance performance to near normal threshold levels of performance at the trained location. And I should um, emphasize that more by saying there is absolute location specificity of learning in this patient population for the trained discrimination task. What do I mean? Is that so if you take this, this person's blind field, for instance, and we have three stimulus locations here, we start and we train them first at the one closest to their border. And this is the performance. This is normalized direction range thresholds. They go from unable to do the task to almost to essentially normal thresholds. We move the stimulus by about two degrees into the blind field. There's a massive amount of overlap between these two stimuli, and yet performance goes back to chance. And yes, you can train this new location, but it takes another 
well, 50 or so sessions to get to, to stable levels of performance. And if you move the stimulus again, you repeat this, there's a seesaw pattern where you basically, anytime you move the stimulus deeper into the blind field, you do not get transfer of learning deeper. You do get partial transfer at the trained location to untrained tasks. And that's, that's a good thing. It means that you don't have to specifically train every single aspect of vision separately. Um, and you also get pa partial uh, transfer to untrained locations, but only for one thing, as far as we've been able to determine, and that's luminance detection. So if I train this person at these locations in their blind field, not only do I get improvements in discrimination performance at these locations, I will also get an improvement in luminance detection along the blind field border. At locations I haven't been near, in fact. So it almost seems like you're reactivating some circuitry here. Um, and that is certainly, um, so I can show you what that looks like. And, and this is, again, one of the advantages of doing clinical perimetry testing on every single one of these patients every time they come into lab is that we can measure their perimetry, their luminance detection um, um, performance pre-training. And then we can do it again post-training. These are these maps, these interpolated maps are derived from Humphrey visual field testing. And we can compute a difference map between the pre and post training. And this is what the difference map is, looks like. And the areas in red and deep red are areas that are, um, show a significant improvement in sensitivity and luminance detection sensitivity. And you can see that they really track along this original border pretty well. They do overlap kind of with the train location, but it's not an absolute overlap. What we do know is that if you don't train the patients at all and just wait the same amount of time, you don't get that spontaneous shift in the blind field border. And that's consistent with the literature in this population that says that once you reach the chronic phase, you do not get spontaneous So here's another interesting thing. It doesn't matter what you train the patient on, whether you train them on orientation discrimination of static Gabor patches or global direction discrimination, or one of each at different location um, in the blind field. It does not matter. You get about, you know, we end up getting after many months of training about a hundred square degrees of recovery to their peri perimetry, to their perimetric blind field. What does seem to matter is the number of training sessions they perform. So if you plot area improve versus number of training session or area improve versus number of training locations in the blind field, you do get um, a significant correlation. So what is going on here? What are the mechanisms of what we are seeing in these chronic patients? And this was the work done by many, um, I would say many talented students, um, over many years, and this was done actually in collaboration with David Heger and Eli Merriam. We did retinotopic mapping in these patients before and after training. And these are just example. We did the, the classic um, rotating wedge, expanding rings. Um, and this is an example of a visual field map we obtained in one of our patients, which shows um, partial damage to V1, V2, V3 even. Okay. And First thing that we, uh, that we found is that pretty much all of these patients had voxels in V1 that corresponded to blind areas of their visual field as determined by perimetry. Okay, there are two examples here of these patients. Now, we just, um, this, this paper has just come out um, in Nature Communications, but it does confirm this finding is not new. It, it really was shown to be the case uh, by, by multiple other people, some of whom are, are on this call. So there is some V1 left. V1 is almost never completely damaged in this patient population. So there's always some V1 left. And there's V1 that represents some blind areas of the visual field. So we're talking about pre-training Humphrey visual field uh, luminance detection sensitivity less than about 15 decibels. There are a significant number of voxels in each of these patients um, corresponding to these areas of the visual field. But the key thing here that we found was that this 
representation in the blind field prior to the onset of training can predict where and how much training induced Humphrey visual field improvements um, these patients will sustain. So I've just put little insets of the maps of Humphrey visual field improvements in each of these two patients. And you can see that basically if there were voxels there in V1, that had strong coherence and amplitude to uh, during retinotopic mapping. They're the ones that give you the strongest amount of um, post-training Humphrey visual field recovery. Um, again, if you don't train, you don't get recovery um, in the visual field, in the Humphrey visual field. But this can be completely predictable. Um, we can also see another phenomenon. I mean, the question is, okay, so you can predict where the recovery is gonna be um, occurring and you can predict by how much they will recover, but um, what does the visual train, does the visual training actually do anything significant to V1 or the rest of the circuitry for that matter? Um, and it turns out that it doesn't change the maps, the visual field maps or, um, or the representation in cortex, the, the retinotopic maps to any significant appreciable extent. However, when we did do um, population receptive field analyses, and, and this is kind of a complicated um, set of graphs showing you examples of three particular patients, their anatomy, their, their Humphrey visual field defect, um, the border and the location of their blind field in each case. And then on the fourth column here, the pre-training population receptive fields in V1 are superimposed over the central area. And the red, um, the red circles are the population receptive fields over the blind field. This is the blind field coverage. And pre-training the blind field coverage is there. It certainly encroaches into the blind field, but post-training it expands significantly. And what expands here is both the coverage of the blind field, and also, yeah, I'm going to the next slide here. And so the, the coverage of the blind field expand, um, this is V1 change in coverage plus in the plus direction for the blind field. The intact field does not change significantly, but what also changes is the PRF size. Um, and, and that is probably the major, the major effect. And it changes primarily in V1, and it's only V1 that shows a significant change post-training. V2, V3, and V4 do not seem to have significant changes. I know. So what can I summarize at this point in time? I can summarize by saying that from what we've done so far, improved luminance detection along the blind field border is associated with recruitment of preserved V1 circuits and increased V1 coverage of the blind field. And it is primarily a V1 driven phenomenon. But that's not all that we're talking about, right? That is seems to be really, I, won't, I don't wanna call this a side phenomenon relative to the visual training, but we are not training on luminance detection. We're training these people on, on sometimes quite complex discriminations within their blind fields. So what mediates that? Is it truly these V1 regions? And I don't think that that is the case. That is still really something that we cannot answer at this point in time. Um, but we have some insight that one of the things that visual global direction discrimination training, for instance, um, increases and improves um, motion adaptation in MT and V5 at the trained blind field location. This is again, fMRI work that was done um, by Michael Melnick when, uh, when he was a graduate student. So there may be other things. We've only looked in MT, we haven't looked in V4 or some of these other extra stride areas to see if for the regions that were trained in the blind field on discrimination tasks, what actually happened to processing in the by these particular areas? Did anything change? I suspect the answer is yet is yes, but I don't really know yet. Okay, this is probably a good spot for me to stop and see if there are any burning questions. So I have a semi-burning question. Yes, um, it's Jeremy. Uh, what what do uh, what do the patients say they see? So, fantastic question. And 
um, let me answer this in two ways. The first is what do they see before we even begin training them? How do they see the blind field? We ask them that question pretty much for every patient. There's a pretty wide range, but in very few cases do they say nothingness is what I see in my blind field. It's like it's the back of my head. I know it's there, but I see, I see nothing. The majority of cases, they have either filling in that is remarkably good. It fools them because they feel like there's nothing missing. Their brain seems to be able to complete the scene in front of them in quite a lot of detail, but they know it's wrong because if they shove their hand in there, it, it's not there. So, and then the third category is they see a mess. They see either, they'll describe it as either a kaleidoscope of, of colors and shapes, um, a grayed area with maybe they see shadows passing through. So that's what they see in terms of their visual world. Now, when we train them, we present them with a blank computer screen with a stimulus on it. And, Initially, they tell us, especially when it's the global motion stimulus, the most common report is, I sense there's motion. I can't see individual dots. I sense it's just something moving and I can't make out which way it's going. With training, once they actually get to recover normal thresholds, they'll say, yeah, I can see individual dots. They're more like wiggly ants. Um, they're not like discrete, crisp little dots, but I can see the motion very clearly and then reliably. So they do progress. And that in chronic patients, that takes months. So can I ask, okay. could this be described as a, a transition from blind sight to conscious sight? It could well be. Um, it could well be. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Absolutely could be. Um, a little hard to explain. Well, it's a little hard to explain how they, um, how they can recover on some of these very, um, very stationary stimuli like the Gabor patches that are fuzzy edges that we, you know, with a slow, that appear with a slow onset, slow offset, tell us the orientation of this thing. Um, I don't know, you know, because that doesn't really elicit blind sight very reliably. I am not sure that I could characterize it in those terms for that. But for almost everything else we do, which we, tends to be motion centric, um, I yes, it could well be going from from some form of blind sight to conscious vision. But it is conscious vision, and when it comes to the border of their blind field, that is also conscious vision that they recover. Um, and the patients will sometimes, um, some of the good ones, <laughs> the good ones in a sense that they're very observant, um, they will actually in their own home, they'll have boundaries and they'll have reference points as to what they can see. So if they, if they look at the faucet on their bathtub, they can see the, the hem of their bathrobe or they can see half the bathrobe after six months of training. You know, so they can actually self-measure what, um, what they see. Okay. Any other burning questions? Um, Thanks, I Oliver. have a question. Sure. Um, you said that the damaged area is filled with the CSF fluid. Mm -hmm. So where the new security is happened actually? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, so that was just one example in one picture. Not everybody looks like that. That was one of the more severe areas of damage. Um, if I had to guess, you know, if, and here I'm going into philosophy more than anything else, I would say that in the initial phases of training, when training actually elicit recovery pretty quickly, I bet that a lot of that is really rooted deeply in residual circuitry in V1. But when it comes to recovery, the longer term recovery of more complicated and more complex aspects of vision and visual processing, including global motion. I think that that invokes higher level extra striate areas um, and it may take longer to achieve um, and to solidify 
And I think that what we're talking about new circuitry, it's not necessarily brand new connections, but just reinforcing existing connections, which we know exist between the LGN and other subcortical centers directly with extra striate cortex. And as V1 gets, you know, whatever's left of V1 gets brought back online, it also feeds into that extra striate circuitry. So everything just gets recruited together, I would think, um, and allowed to develop a new steady state. But that takes a long time and a lot of work on the part of the patient to, to push these circuits to function. Okay. All right. I am going to keep going here, if that's okay. All right. So at this point, you know, having worked with chronic, uh, chronic patients for, for many years, we, we started noticing some very key limitations and trying to deliberately go after them. The training was very slow. The recovery was very slow. I've mentioned this before. The lack of trans automatic transfer deeper in the blind field, especially, was very frustrating to us and the patients. Even when we were able to improve contrast sensitivity in the blind field. Um, it still remained very poor. And when we tried to actually deliberately train and improve and try and recover contrast sensitivity, and we did this with static flicker and moving uh, Gabor patches that, that we presented at lower and lower contrast as patients were, were doing the tasks more successfully. And this is work that um, a, a current graduate student, Jingyi Yang, is doing uh, right now. Even when we were, um, we trained them for many months, we were unable to significantly improve their contrast thresholds from zero. I mean, they, they hovered around zero. So there were some exceptions to that. But by, by and large, these patients were very resistant to any um, changes in contrast performance and luminance contrast, I should say. Um, and another problem is that if you train complex, a complex discrimination like uh, direction integration in the blind field, it does transfer and automatically improve a simpler task like simple lum, uh, direction discrimination of a drifting Gabor patch. But if you do the other way around, if you train people on simple left versus right direction discrimination of a Gabor patch, it does not automatically transfer to more complex discrimination such as direction integration. You have to train that specifically. Um, even when you train um, direction discrimination, let's say in the blind field, uh, if you train people on left versus right, that does, they do improve their fine direction discrimination, but their thresholds remain three to five times higher than normal. So they're, so the vision in the blind field remains very low contrast and very coarse. Okay. And another problem is that even if we train, if like we did in most cases, motion, global motion perception in the blind field and recovered that, this does not automatically recover unconscious pre-processing of motion signal for actions. What do I mean by that? This was work done by Jude Mitchell and Sunwoo Kwan um, here at Rochester um, in collaboration with my lab. So Sunwoo and Jude had actually published a paper with Martin Rolls um, a few years, I think a few years ago now, and in which they described this phenomenon of post-saccadic following response. So what does that mean? It's basically a, um, here's the paradigm. There's a fixation spot. Um, after the fixation spot is, um, stays on for a little while, four drifting dot targets appear in the visual periphery. One of them is cued with a spatial cue, um, directing the person that that's the one that they have to saccade to. And that's the only task that the person has to do. They just have to saccade to the target that was cued. When they do so, and here's an example on the right-hand side of one of our patients saccading to a target in their intact hemifield, once they land on the saccade target, um, the eye actually follows the direction of motion of the target. It's, a, it's done at a lower speed, there's a lower gain of this particular phenomenon. But interestingly enough, and this is what we call the post-saccadic following response, but 
interestingly enough, they this post saccadic following response occurs even if you make the target disappear in mid saccad flight. And that suggested that the processing for of the motion of this target occurred prior to the saccade onset. Okay, this is an automatic phenomenon. It occurs without conscious um, conscious awareness of, without awareness of that this processing is actually being done. When you measure the the ability this particular phenomenon in cortically blind patients with and cue them to move their eyes and to saccade to a target in their blind field. They're quite capable of saccading to it very accurately. They land in the middle of the um, saccade target just fine, but their eyes do not follow the target motion until, until they actually um, are on the target for long enough to actually see it and if the target is present. So they do not exhibit a post saccadic following response. The interesting thing for us is that even when you've trained them and they recover global motion perception at this location, they're quite able, they have normal direction integration thresholds, normal direction discrimination thresholds for targets in that blind field location following training. They never recover this post saccadic following response. So, this was very puzzling to us, but it suggested that when you're training and, and uh, the data is really, the key data is here in this graph, which shows uh, PFR gain on the vertical axis and, no, and, and direction integration threshold, normalized direction range threshold on the, on the, on the X axis. Um, a threshold of one here, hundred percent means that the person cannot do the task at all. And you would not expect a PFR gain at all for this, for this performance. The white dots indicate performance in the intact field. And in the intact field of vision, uh, normals, normal subjects and even people um, with cortical blindness, but measured in their intact field, show a nice correlation between integration thresholds and the PFR gain. The better the threshold, the lower the threshold, the higher the PFR gain. But in people that you've retrained so that they actually have normal uh, direction range thresholds in their blind field, they do not recover uh, a normal PFR gain at all. So it basically suggests that even though we have recovered uh, conscious visual perception, conscious motion perception in the blind field of these patients at that location, not everything recovers along with that. Not every aspect of visual processing, including visual processing this, that it may be important for action, um, those things don't necessarily recover. So we've spent quite a bit of time um, in the last few years trying to figure out if we can overcome these limitations of training in the chronic blind, in chronic blind fields. Can we attain better, faster recovery? And we've thrown a lot of different approaches at this. In collaboration with Marissa Carrasco in particular, we've uh, explored directing endogenous attention to the blind field, either feature-based attention or spatial attention. And we've shown, actually we published this um, in 2019, showing that feature-based attention can be used to recover completely normal fine direction discrimination thresholds in the blind field. Oops, sorry. Um, we now um, have some results with encouraging results with spatial attention as well. We've also used electrical, non-invasive electrical brain stimulation, in particular TRNS, to enhance learning speed when presented in conjunction with these motion stimuli in the blind field. And more recently started a collaboration um, about trying to investigate the potential benefits of uh, multisensory integration in virtual reality um, to enhance training. But what I wanna finish with today is, is the question of should we start training earlier after stroke? And I was, I was kind of thrust into this, asking this question by an MD PhD student who joined my lab, Elizabeth Seance, um, who came from, from a deep background in sensory motor stroke in her prior work. And she said, you know, in sensory motor stroke, the practice is to begin rehabilitation as early as you can. And there's a lot of literature showing the benefits of that. So Libby decided that she was going to ask this question in um, cortically blind participants. So she recruited 18 subacute CBs who were less than three months post-stroke. 
and 14 chronics who were more than six months post-stroke. And she trained them and mapped them and trained them identically and looked at the outcome. But that was when she got her first surprise. So she started by measuring as we typically do and mapping global direction discrimination in the blind field. And it's always absent in the blind field in our chronic patients. And sure enough, she measured here, this was a fine direction discrimination task um, using random dot stimuli. So in the blind field, which is blue, um, the patient, the chronic patients were unable to do this task. That's why their threshold is at maxed out at 90. Um, the subacutes had really good thresholds um, in, uh, sorry, the chronics and the subacutes had really good thresholds in their intact field. So we knew that they could do this task. But this was 12, the, so 12 of the subacutes acted just like chronics, could not do the task in their blind field, but seven of them could. And if you add up these numbers, you'll see that uh, 12 and seven is 19. So in fact, one of the subacutes had one location in their blind field where they could not do the task and another where they could. Their thresholds were elevated relative to normal, but they were measurable. Similarly, um, again, with integration thresholds, chronics couldn't, can never do this task in their blind field. Some of the same subacutes could not either, but three out of the seven here um, were able to um, get a measurable um, NDR threshold in their blind field prior to training. This is all prior to training. And just to say that this isn't just a question of being really close to the border here and maybe straddling it. This is one of these participants, one of these subacutes who we went and mapped the entire blind field border as far as we could go on our computer screen. And this person had measurable thresholds for these two tasks at all of them. Okay, so very nice. In addition to this, um, we could also measure contrast sensitivity, which is always absent in chronic CB blind fields, but it was preserved in some of these subacutes. The red is the intact field, and these are some of the subacute um, contrast sensitivity versus spatial frequency plots um, for non flickering gabors, for flickering gabors, and for drifting gabors here. So, not great performance, but measurable. Nonetheless, it's not a flat line um, as it usually is for the chronics. Okay, so what is going on here? This stroke is supposed to wipe out conscious vision right off the bat, and it doesn't seem to be the case. So why is that? And our thought was that it might be a consequence of progressing retrograde degeneration. Again, this is a phenomenon that has been well described over, over many years. And um, my postdoc, Berkeley Fahrenthold, um, actually was the one who, in collaboration with Holly Bridges' lab, um, performed kind of a retrospective study of the databases that we had on this patient population just to look and see if we could measure uh, retrograde degeneration across time since stroke onset. Um, what she did was basically to use structural MRIs, um, cut through the optic tracts, and then she measured the volumes of the optic tract ipsilesionally on the side of the lesion and contralesionally, and then um, computed a laterality index for how much shrinkage there was on the side of the um, occipital stroke. And if you take visually intact people um, and measure the laterality index, it hovers around zero. Um, Subacute occipital stroke patients fall well within the normal range. After six months post-stroke, however, you get an explosion. So chronic patients, some of them fall within the normal range too of laterality index. They show no clear evidence of, um, of shrinkage of the optic tracts, but um, there are a significant por proportion of them who do. And in fact, if you plot the pre-training laterality index in the optic tract, against how much change in Humphrey parametry these patients get from training. So if you train, if you take these chronics and train them uh, for an equivalent amount of time, then you actually get a pretty good correlation. Those who have fairly normal looking um, optic tracts with little degeneration give you the best, um, the best uh, or the greatest amount of recovery. And you can eliminate this outlier over here and still get a significant correlation. Sorry. 
Okay, so could the subacute patients then, if you catch them before there is strong evidence of retrograde degeneration in their early visual pathway, could they benefit from training? And we can ask several sub questions. Can these residual conscious vision abilities be preserved that are, cure, that are still there in the, uh, in the blind field in subacutes be pres preserved by early training? Can the um, vision training, if administered early enough, stop or slow the retrograde degeneration? And can the vision already lost be regained more easily if you, um, if you start training earlier? And we have some answers here. We think that this first um, question is, is, the answer is yes. Um, the second question we don't know yet, we're figuring that out. And the third question, we have a resounding yes on that. And what is the data for this? The data is as follows. This is work again of Elizabeth Seance. She took um, chronics um, and two classes of subacutes, one that she ended up training, one that she ended up not training. Um, she selected patients who had no preservation of um, global direction discrimination in their blind field at baseline so that everybody was on the same play playing field. The chronics improved with training. The trained subacutes improved to a similar extent. The untrained subacutes did not. There is no spontaneous recovery on this task during the subacute period. And I think that's an important facet. But here's a big difference. The chronics required on average about 100 sessions to reach that recovery, whereas the trained subacutes required an average of 16. That's about two weeks of training as opposed to several months. In addition, the chronics, as we showed before, they never transfer their learning deeper into the blind field, whereas the trained subacutes transferred at least one degree, but up to more up to 10 degrees um, deeper into their blind field. So what have we learned so far? If I may summarize, people with V1 damage, adults with V1 damage are capable of restorative plasticity they surprisingly actually have some preservation of visual discrimination abilities in their parametrically blind fields early after the stroke. But those are normally lost by the time that the chronic period occurs. You never see those in chronics unless they've been trained as subacute. Subacute patients also exhibit much greater training-induced plasticity than chronic patients. They seem to have faster recovery and they actually have transferred deeper into the blind fields, which the chronics do not. And of course, there are still a lot of questions, including whether we can actually slow or stop retrograde degeneration if we start training early or with other, other interventions. The mechanisms of plasticity may in fact be quite different um, in the subacute versus late post-stroke periods. And then of course, the age old question of all of these training approaches that at least our lab has worked with and how relevant they are um, to actually improving functional vision in this patient population. That certainly remains to be um, determined. But all in all, um, if I can send you home with a um, take home message, I would say that time is definitely vision after stroke. It's not just the case that time is brain, time is vision when you have an occipital stroke. And early intervention may actually be really important, both to minimize the vision loss and to maximize restoration potential. And on that note, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you very much, Crystal. I'd like to ask everybody to unmute yourself for an exciting and intriguing talk. Okay. Uh, beautiful results. Um, so I'm opening the stage for questions and I'll start myself. Um, I, I want to ask about the uh, um, um, endurance of the, um, of the effects, whether uh, once um, a location with all its specificity has recovered or reached some improvement, how long have you tested how long this lasts? If this is something that they have to uh, maintain with uh, uh, training or does it just stay? Um, uh... I've only done this in very few people and the longest I've gone is four years after we stopped training in, in one person. I've tested one year and it's in a couple of other people. It seems that as long as they can use the 
abilities they've recovered in their everyday life, it can be indefinitely kept. And that's especially true of the visual field enlargement, the parametric changes, as long as they're aware of them and then they make use of them in their everyday life, you can remeasure these parametric field changes. We've done that more commonly because we can ask them, you know, go to your eye doctor and have a Humphrey visual field and then send us the data so we can actually see if that they've changed. You know, there's problems because the machines are different and so on, but you get a rough idea anyway. So, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, um, I have more, but yes, Jan? Um, is it truly that they're maintaining those uh, benefits or is it actually that they're using microsaccades or something like that into the good field and back again to improve on that border because you know it might be it might be a, a retraining of your minimal use of your eye movements if you like that might yeah, give that's... you that benefit but i don't i don't know so no that that's a perfectly Fantastic question, Jan, because this was exactly what stank Nova Vision. I'm sorry, I hope there are no Nova Vision affiliates. But we have actually verified that the Humphrey visual field improvements, which are all measured with an eye tracker turned on in the machine, but it's not a great eye tracker. So you you, you know, people could still do what you're talking about and, and see improvement on the Humphrey. But we've done this using a, um, a machine called a Maya. So every time we collect a Humphrey now, we also collect a Maya test. The Maya is a microperimetry device that is like a, a scanning ophthalmoscope. It takes a picture of the retina, finds the fovea, and then tracks it, and then presents dots of light in, in a system, in the same system as the, um, the Humphrey 10-2. And we find that we can replicate our Humphrey improvements on the Maya. So we know that, yeah, that system would catch any sort of micro saccades that the person is doing. And in fact, it measures their extent and how we know how much they're doing. So no, it, mm -hmm. in our, at least in our case, I can tell you that our data is pretty solid. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, maybe I missed this, but um, did you talk about the quality of life measures? I saw in the beginning, you mentioned that you were checking those. Oh yeah, we met, so we started collecting those. We even have, I think we had a presentation at probably VSS many, many years ago. Um, that is to be continued because the problem is that we measured improvement in quality of life according to the VFQ25. So that's the NEI quality of life questionnaire um, that we have available here. There were, there were improvements on all the measures that you would think should improve with visual training and rehabilitation in this patient population. But what we did not have is a control group. So we're talking about a lot of these improvements, these are subjective tests, right? So a lot of these improvements could have been due to people. We pay it a lot of attention to our patients. It's an intervention. Just the fact that we sit there, we listen to them, we, we probe them about what their life is like every time they're here. So that's an intervention itself. And we did not have a control group that had some form of training that's not effective, that they can take home and do until now. So we just started a clinic, a new clinical trial. And once we have the result of that, I'm hoping that we will have some interpretable quality of life data. But you know, at the end of the day, and I see Ellie there, and I'm I'm totally reminded that at the end of the day, we do we train them on global motion in their blind field at one spot, two spots, three spots. How does that transfer to their functionality, really? in everyday life. And that is, that is the big question mark. I don't have an answer for that yet. Okay. Um, I have another question, if I may. I wanna ask about um, the idea to try um, use um, kind of like time to collision, but not necessarily time to collision, but the, uh, the idea that um, uh, you don't start 
uh, you don't move as um, the the field of training, but rather if you have some uh, motion trajectory from the intact field into the um, uh, deficient field, how far would they be able to like detect or would that kind of like a prediction or expectation uh, or this logic would that be able to assist in some way? Absolutely. I think that I think those are great ideas. And I know one of my postdoc is really interested in, in doing some of the this kind of testing and also and also asking people to do comparison tasks between the intact and the blind field to really try and get a better idea of, of what these patients are sensing and seeing in their blind field. And how does that change as a function of training? Yeah, those are those are great questions. Does anything interesting happen if you have simultaneous stimulation in, in the intact field? So partic particularly at, at, at uh, symmetrical locations? I'm sure it does, especially in extra striate cortex. <laughs> I'm sure it does. And I'm, I'm reminded of this in the context of optic flow, for instance and how that information is processed. I mean, th this is one of the problems that these folks have is navigation. Also, you know, when they're driving lane placement, um, which, which is still somewhat unresolved um, as to why it's abnormal. So, so yes, processing of visual information across, across the two hemispheres and at corresponding location, how that's integrated, is it integrated correctly? Don't know. Don't know. If I could just comment on the lane placement in driving, uh -huh. um, it's uh, it's completely uh, defensive driving. The right hemianops move to the left. The left hemianops move to the right. They get away from the blind <laughs> side and closer to the sighting side. So I don't see that as anything to do with the way they see, but rather the way they drive to to protect themselves. There's no doubt there's that component of defensiveness that it plays a huge part in, in, in especially in real driving, but also in simulated driving. But I thought there were some, also some um, studies showing that aside from the safety aspect, and if you take them into, into a simulated environment, which is supposedly safe, they still do not place themselves quite correctly in the middle of the lane. Um, yeah. And they may shift towards their blind side in addition to um, the other option, so. That is true, but we've shown that normally sighted in a simulator, when a truck or an ambulance come on the other side, they move to the right to avoid, presumably running sure. into a, a virtual uh, ambulance. This is simply what people do. It's um, it's psychology, uh, defensive driving, whatever you want to call it, not, not vision. Yeah, and that makes it difficult to really under, understand exactly what is going on, whether what, what is vision and what is just compensation. Yeah. But to, back to Jeremy's question, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. I'm sure there, there are clearly connections between the two hemispheres, and that is one of the... One of the um, things that we are also manipulating in this clinical trial that we just started. And that is we have one group of patients who are testing in their intact hemifield. We'll see if that has an impact. Um, I wanted to ask, you said, is it true that they have a, they have a, a perm, permission to, to drive? Do they have a, <laughs> it's, it, yep. Uh, it's variable. Let's put it that way. Uh, Ellie can probably speak to that much more uh, clearly. There are differences in different that. states, but they can legally legally drive in Belgium, in uh, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, England recently uh, approved it. In Canada, in some of the provinces, and in uh, about half the states in in, in uh, the USA, they can legally drive. So. Um, yeah, and even in states when they can't, to think <laughs> they still do. What we think about the ability, and I'm not encouraging 
driving with hemianopia in general because our results show that many of them cannot compensate. And, and uh, you know, we show that uh, uh, overall 10% of intersections, they don't look to the blind side. To me, that's a, overall the whole group. And then there are individuals that don't look at 30% of the intersection to the blind side. To me, this is a, a, a dramatic uh, Russian roulette if you uh, cross an intersection without looking to the blind side. But as the legal situation is, they can drive in many places and um, it's hard to find what, what to do with it. And they are varied. Some of them, um, some of them look at the blind side at every intersection. So, yeah. So uh, it's it's basically it's dangerous to themselves and to others in a way. Are they not? Uh, well, okay. I guess that's a personal uh, uh, thing if they are or are not afraid to do that. Um, there are there's a huge variance, Sharon. Yeah. I mean, there are people who are who live in states where they're allowed to drive if they wanted to, and they choose not to because they don't want to risk hurting yeah. anyone or themselves. So there's a huge spread in the population yeah. on this. <laughs> yeah. Um any more questions? I mean, I, I'm probably gonna write to you. <laughs> I mean, the most uh, amazing thing is the fact that with the uh, saccades, that they don't follow the, that's like um, kind of a weird associate. I mean, anyway, uh, for me, it's a weird association. Um, but again, I want to, it's a fascinating topic and I, I really hope that you, uh, you progress and it's amazing. Uh, um, that you're um, assisting to help and change their lives. And for this exciting uh, talk, I want to thank you. And I want to um, you're welcome you again. Um, Good seeing everybody. <laughs> um, and yeah. I hope that um, I'll be in touch uh, with respect to yeah. putting it online. Next yeah. week, everybody is again synchronized uh, with the daylight savings um, uh, time. So we're back to uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Canada and U.S. Uh, East Coast. And uh, Mary Hayhoe will be here to give us um, uh, a talk. So I hope all of you or anyone, you're welcome to join us. Um, and thanks again, Crystal, for a wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon.